Now, remember the Spanish-American War? Probably most of you don't remember it, but it was a... <laughs> It was in 19, uh, pardon me, it was 1898. And as a result of this war, which was truly an imperialistic war, why we ended up controlling Cuba and the Philippines and Puerto Rico and, and all of these countries that had been controlled previously uh, by, um, uh, by the, the Spanish. So in 1902, why the American government, well, you have term power there, and then the American government granted limited independence to uh, Cuba, but we reserved the right to intervene at any time. By 1928, there was a President Machado who was in, in power in Cuba. He was pro-communist, and, and of course, when he, uh, his term in office was up, he refused to leave. So uh, by 1933, they had a dictatorship uh, in Cuba. It was a pro-communist dictatorship, and uh, the army said, we've got to do something about it. Three sergeants led a bloodless coup. One of them was, of course, uh, Batista. And uh, immediately, in 1933, the United States government recognized Batista's government and immediately granted Cuba full independence. So obviously we supported what he had done. In 1940, a democratic election was held. Batista was elected. And of course, established a free enterprise system, got away from socialism, and uh, things were going pretty well. But by 1944, while the communists were there, they were working, there was another election, Batista lost the election. They didn't have voting machines at that time, but uh, under these circumstances. Uh, by 1948, uh, the new regime, of course, was uh, pretty well corrupt, moving towards communism. Batista had actually left Cuba. He'd come to Florida. He was going to get out of politics. Cuban military asked uh, Batista if he would uh, run for the Senate. Batista said, no, I'm not going to run for the Senate. I'm through. But they put his name in, running for the Cuban Senate. He was elected. So he went back there and, and of course, since began to, um, uh, was there. Uh, the regime was totally corrupt. I mean, they were stealing money, they were supposed to be burning money that was outdated and they were keeping it, and, and the country was going from bad to worse. So again, the, the Cuban military asked Batista uh, to take over control, and of course, uh, they had a revolution, and uh, Batista once again uh, became the temporary dictator of Cuba. Now, in 1948, there was a Pan-American conference that was held in Bogota, Colombia. At that time, a young revolutionary named Fidel Castro seized the radio station in, in Bogota and said, this is a Cuban revolution, and I am Fidel Castro leading this revolution. All of our State Department officials were there. They knew Fidel Castro was a communist at that time, but they certainly didn't want the American people to know that. But anyway, it was in March of 1952 that Batista led another bloodless coup. Nobody was killed. Uh, and uh, the following year, on July 26, 1953, Fidel Castro led a revolution where they actually uh, tried to overthrow the government. Uh, he failed. He was arrested. He was sent to the Isle of Pines where he had a private room, a car. Uh, he could travel. He could do whatever he wanted to. But he was a political prisoner. Nobody was killed. In November of 1954, another democratic election was held with representatives from around the world, held in Cuba, and of course, Batista was elected by the people president. And Batista made one serious error. He turned Fidel Castro loose. And Fidel Castro then, in December of 1956, after going to Mexico, which most of you don't know, but has been a communist country for many, many years, they had their communist revolution back in the 1930s, and he was able to get all sorts of support for his communist revolution there. Incidentally, we're being invaded by Mexico today, whether you know it or not. Anyway, in 1956, in December, Fidel Castro attacked Oriente province with 150 men only 12 or 13 survived. One of them was Fidel Castro. And so in February 1957, why Herbert Matthews was sent by the New York Times uh, to Cuba to interview Fidel Castro and came back and announced that he was the true Robin Hood. He wasn't a communist at all. He was the Abraham Lincoln of the revolution. And Fide Fide Herbert Matthews over and over again made the statement, Fidel Castro is not a communist. Articles picked up all across America came to be believed. Of course, then, in 
June of 1957, um, Ambassador Smith was appointed to become the ambassador. And of course, uh, who do you think that they had uh, brief him uh, about uh, what was going to happen in Cuba? Well, the State Department signed Herbert Matthews to brief Ambassador Smith. And then, of course, there's an Ambassador Hill, though, uh, who also was very knowledgeable, and he told Ambassador Smith this. You were assigned to Cuba to preside over the downfall of Batista. The decision has been made that Batista has to go. Be very careful. And so, in August of 1957, uh, the communists began attacking civilian targets in Cuba and Batista suspended the constitution temporarily and immediately we attacked him. He's a dictator. He suspended the constitution. Just like uh, they've done over in France. Chirac did it this last week, but nobody's calling him a dictator for trying to restore law and order. Well, let's, uh, let's go ahead and play my interview. Ambassador Smith was a financier and corporate director. He held appointments from three presidents of the United States during the years 1957 to 1959. He was the American ambassador to Cuba during that tragic time of the Cuban Revolution when Fidel Castro came to power. Ambassador Smith, can you give me the background of your initial briefing from the State Department before going to Cuba in 1957? I was uh, briefed in Washington for a period of six weeks. And during that time, I was asked to make an appointment with Herbert Matthews of the New York Times so that he could brief me. Uh, I think this is of special importance because of the fact I don't believe any other American ambassador has ever been briefed by a uh, newspaper correspondent regarding the country to which he was to be appointed to. And it, is no, it was known at the time that, uh, of course, that uh, Herbert Matthews was a strong proponent of Fidel Castro, and that Fidel Castro was dedicated to the overthrow of the government of Cuba by force. Now, were you given any inkling of the communist background of Fidel Castro? I was given plenty of inkling. Uh, no, I want to change that. Uh, no, I was not. In all the time that I was in Washington, I don't ever recall the State Department saying a good word about Batista and I don't ever recall him saying a bad word about Fidel Castro. But did the State Department know about the communist infiltration of Fidel Castro's revolutionary movement? Oh, I think so. I think it was known from the time of the Bogotazo, which took place in Bogota uh, in 1948. I think the CIA and the FBI and also uh, the Assistant Secretary of State for Latin American Affairs and the head of the Caribbean Division were both in Bogota at the time so on active, on active uh, duty for the State Department. So they knew about the communist infiltration, but they didn't relay this information to you? Uh, well, that is correct. What about Mr. William Wheeland and Roy Rubottom, who were both in the State Department? What was their background as far as the Bogota uprising, and what part did they play in the bringing of Fidel Castro to power? Well, as I recall, uh, Rube Bottom acted as secretary for a, this is now we're going back quite a few years, but uh, as I recall it, he was secretary of uh, the mission that was down there and was representing the State Department at that time. This was in Bogota at the in time? In Bogota at the time. It was called a Bogotazo because uh, one of the leaders of the uprising was Fidel Castro himself. And was this a communist uprising? Yes, it was uh, always uh, maintained to be a communist uprising. And uh, not a communist uprising, but a, an uprising which was uh, uh, led by the communists and instigated by the communists. Now, what part did Mr. Wheeland and Mr. Rubottom play in the ultimate fall of Cuba in 1959? Well, Mr. Rubottom and Mr. Wheeland were really the top men of what I call the fourth floor. And the fourth floor is a book, and I wrote a book with that name. It must be taken symbolically. The, it means where the Latin American officers had their desks in the State Department because they were situated on the fourth floor. And Mr. Whelan and Mr. Rubottom were the leaders of the fourth floor. They were the top men. Mr. Rubottom was Assistant Secretary of State for Latin American Affairs, and Mr. Whelan was the head of the Caribbean Division. And they influenced the, our actions in Cuba by their day-by-day -day actions. And they were uh, 
instrumental in doing everything that they could to uh, uh, see that Fidel Castro was removed from office. That Fidel Castro was removed from office? Yeah. Or Not Batista? Just, excuse me, Batista was removed from office. I think we'll have to redo that one. All right. <laughs> well, did the State Department actively work to bring Fidel Castro to power? The State Department actively worked through the day-by-day -day actions of the men who were situated on the fourth floor. They were the people connected with the Caribbean and uh, all of Latin America. Mr. Uh, the Secretary of State was completely preoccupied with Berlin and Tokyo and uh, Moscow so that he left everything to the Assistant Secretary of State for Latin American Affairs, who was Mr. Rubato. Did Mr. Wieland and Roy Rubottom, who were from the American State Department, know about the communist influence within Fidel Castro's revolutionary movement? I don't think that Mr. Rubottom and Mr. Wieland knew that Fidel Castro was a communist, but I do think that they were familiar with the fact of his communist activities as a boy when he, from the fact that he was an active leader in the uprising in Bogota in April of 1948. At that time, I believe that uh, Fidel Castro was only 22 years of age, and there's no question about it that he was an unstable youth. And what happened at the Bogota uprising in 1948? Well, the Bogota uprising was a communist-inspired uprising for the overthrow of uh, Gaitan, I think his name was, G-A-I-T-A-N. And uh, it was a communist-inspired uprising which Fidel Castro led the youth end of it, and uh, it is very famous in history. I see. Yeah. What did the American State Department do to undermine Batista's oh. position and aid the revolutionary movement of Fidel Castro? Well, that was done in the day-by-day -day actions of those on the fourth floor, and the fourth floor was be taken symbolically. That word represents where the officers of, had their, of the Latin American officers had their deaths in the State Department. And in their day-by-day -day actions, they did everything they could, it seemed to me, to uh, undermine Batista and to help Castro. So what specific things did they do to undermine Batista? Well, there were, uh, there were about 20 that I've listed. And as I'll give them to you as, I, as they come to, uh, to mind, if you want me to. All right, please do. Uh, we'll say one of the main things that was done was when they stopped the shipment of arms in 1958, in March of 1958. Under the MAG program, the United States government was supplying arms to Central America and to Latin America. That was for hemisphere defense. Uh, there were 1,980 Garland rifles that were to be shipped. And the Fidel Castro group, the 26th of July movement in, the, in Washington, were able to persuade the State Department officials that they should cancel that shipment of arms. Now, the actual loss of the arms did not mean so much to the Batista, but it was the psychological effect of which it hurt the morale of the people around him and the army officers and his generals. On the other hand, it was a great psychological uplift to the Castro people because they knew that uh, Batista had lost the support of the United States government. Well, now then, was Batista able to buy weapons from other countries, or did we yes, try to block no, he that? Got, he got his weapons from the Dominican Republic, from Trujillo, who was in the, uh, the dictator at that time in uh, Ciudad Trujillo. Uh, and also, the United States asked other countries not to s sell arms to Batista. This is really intervention by innuendo. What about other military equipment that he needed? Uh, was he able to get other specific things? What about parts for his uh, military vehicle? No, they, we also stopped, they also stopped the shipment of parts, airplanes. We sold 15 airplanes and, and Batista paid for them. Uh, and uh, the State Department canceled it. I call it reneging on a, on a deal. And the excuse was that uh, they could use those planes for bombing the revolutionaries where they were just plain ordinary training planes. Also, the same thing took place with uh, armored cars. We sold them 20 armored cars and Batista paid for them. And we never delivered those. 
due to the pressure which was put on the State Department by the members of the 26th of July movement. And they had their representatives in Washington. They had a legal representative and they also, we were also dealing with other emissaries. Now what about Fidel Castro? Where was he getting his weapons? Fidel Castro was receiving his weapons, a great many of them, from the United States. They were financed by Prio, who was the former president of Cuba, and uh, they were sending planes, landing money, bodies, and uh, uh, rifles, and they were dropping them into Sierra Maestra. But weren't there laws? Weren't there American laws to prevent this? Yes, there were laws, but uh, the laws were violated, and we did not. Uh, we winked. At, we winked at them. Now, it was my understanding. Well, the State Department winked at them. It was my understanding that um, uh, President Batista asked that this be stopped, and that were certain actions taken by our government to stop the shipment of arms from America to Fidel Castro. Yes, they did take certain actions. Uh, Doctor Prio. Uh, was arrested and put in jail, but he was only there for a short period of time. And he was placed in jail and arrested because he'd uh, broken our, our uh, rules, our laws, about uh, helping revolutionaries for the overthrow of the government of Cuba. And in return for which, uh, Batista promised, and he did, renewed con constitutional guarantees and uh, lifted censorship on the press. Uh, this had, was done three times while I was ambassador to Cuba. When I say three times, at three different occasions, the president of, of Cuba. Mr. William Wheeland and Roy Rubottom were high officials in the American State Department. Did they have any knowledge of the communist influence within Fidel Castro's revolutionary movement? William Wheeland was uh, in charge of the Caribbean Division and he served directly under Mr. Roy Rubottom, who was Assistant Secretary of State for Latin American Affairs. And they were fully informed of everything that was going on in, through the Latin American desk and through what I call the fourth floor, which is symbolically represents the, where the desk officers who represent Latin America were situated. Now, it, it, it's a fact that Mr. Rubottom was in Bogota at the time of the Bogotazo in 1948, and he served as secretary to the Ninth International Conference, of which, and he was a delegate there. Uh, and that is what Roy, not Roy, but Fidel Castro was trying to overthrow. And he was about 22 years of age, and he led the communist uprising, attempting to overthrow the delegation. And that was in Bogota, Colombia. And that was in Bogota, Colombia. All right, sir. Now, do you feel that the mass media in America, the newspapers, television, radio stations, gave the American public an accurate appraisal, an accurate picture of what was actually happening in Cuba? No, I don't think they did. The bearded boys were good copy. Therefore, they seized upon the opportunity. Also, it was a, uh, the overthrow of a rightist dictator which they are also dedicated to, many of the media. And so they pictured Fidel Castro as a political Robin Hood, and actually likened him to Abraham Lincoln, many of the press, which was giving a false impression to a young revolutionary who was completely unstable, always had been. When I went to Cuba, I went down very carefully after I'd been there for a month, went through all the police records, and went very carefully into his background. and. Uh, uh, I discussed with many people over there who were not in favor of Batista and also not in favor of Castro, but they knew that Castro would be worse for Cuba than, than uh, Batista. And uh, Father Kelly, who was the head of Villanova University, told me that when uh, uh, Castro attended his university, he had an accident on a motorbike and was unconscious for a long time, and he doesn't believe that he ever was completely sane after that accident. And yet this was the man that our State Department seemed to want to bring to power. Yes, this is the man that our State Department did want to bring into power. Now, do you think that the New York Times was fair and impartial in its reporting of what transpired? Well, the New York Times was really responsible for bringing Herbert Matthews back to life and giving him the stature that he had. Shortly after uh, 
the group of 81 men that came from Mexico and landed on the south coast of Oriente with Fidel Castro, which took place in December 1956. Fulgencio Batista released word that Fidel Castro was dead. So the people in Cuba thought he was dead. They paid no attention to him. By gunboats and by uh, Cuban soldiers who met the expeditionary force, most of them were killed. I think there were only 12 men left with Fidel Castro at that time. Fidel Castro knew that this would have to be corrected. So he contacted the New York Times office in Havana and asked that a reporter be sent out to interview him. This would prove that he was dead and he would also get a chance for an interview. The New York Times received a request from Ruby Hart Phillips, who was the head of the New York Times office in Havana, that they send down a correspondent. They sent down Herbert Matthews. Herbert Matthews spent, I believe, two days and one night had his picture taken. The picture appeared on the front page of the New York Times. This all came out in February 1957. And they printed three front page articles that appeared on a Saturday and a Sunday and a Monday, which likened uh, Fidel Castro to Abraham Lincoln and spoke of him as being a political Robin Hood. But those articles gave Fidel Castro stature all over the world and made it easier for him to get money and support. And of course, the rest of the press picked it up because it was good copy, as I said a few minutes ago. Well, now, were there, were there other alternatives to Fidel Castro? In other words, were there other groups within Cuba that we could have supported and brought a democratic society to Cuba, a free democratic society? There were other people opposed to Batista in addition to the 26th of July movement, which was led by Fidel Castro, and in addition to the uh, Directorial Revolutionario, which was a communist group in, in uh, Havana. They were what I call the legal opposition. They were lawyers, they were good business, they were businessmen, and they were the ones who thought that Batista had outsourced his usefulness, but they also realized that Castro would be worse for Cuba than Batista. So they did not support Fidel Castro or the 26th of July movement. And I'm naming such people as uh, Mario Lazo, who was the author of Dagger in the Heart. He was the outstanding lawyer of the firm of Lazo with Cubas in Havana. Uh, Guillermo Belt, who was a former ambassador of the United States from Cuba. Uh, Father Kelly, the head of Villanova University, etc., etc. Now, were there opportunities when we might have supported these people and brought about a, a free and democratic Cuba? There there were many times when there were viable solutions to the situation in Cuba without Batista and without Castro. The State Department never would support any of those solutions, always on the, for the reason that they did not want to intervene in the foreign affairs of, of Cuba. Whereas I've shown in my book and written, pointed out where we intervene every day positively and negatively and by innuendo. Uh, the viable solutions that I mentioned, when the State Department would not support any of them, it was very difficult for me to go ahead. However, the papal nuncio told me that he would carry the ball and would go ahead with, and work on these solutions. However, he would have to have our support. And without our support, he could not go on. So in other words, the Catholic Church was prepared to go ahead. Ambassador, what were the viable solutions to Fidel Castro taking over? Well, there are a number of them, but they're based around the premise that Batista would appoint a provisional government without Castro, and that the papal nuncio would carry the ball, he would talk to Batista, and would arrange for it, and then Batista would leave the country, and we'd have a pro provisional government. But this provisional government would have to be recognized by the United States and would have to receive arms so they could uh, carry on. Now, the United States at no time, or I would rather say the State Department at no time would, would do this or would follow through because they believed that it would be intervening in the foreign affairs of Cuba, which after all by that time is not, it was beside the point because we've been intervening continuously, positive and negatively by innuendo. Uh, now, if we had done this, when you set up a provisional government, then it would have been necessary for us to see that we had honest elections and that would require landing troops or doing whatever was necessary. 
Otherwise, we do what we have done here in Latin America and in various places where we get rid of a rightist dictator and we leave a vacuum for the communists to step in. Had we, perform, had we uh, been willing to support a provisional government, Dr. Marcus Sterling was willing to go on and was willing to be the head of it and only stay in office if he were elected for six months and then step down and call for new elections. But you can't just appoint a provisional government and not do anything to support them. You have to maybe land troops, you have to supply arms, and you have to maintain that government force and to see that elections are honest. Now, were you instructed by the State Department to tell Batista that he had to leave? On December 17, 1958, upon instruction of the Defense Department, I went out to, to Kukini, which is his place outside of Havana, uh, and told him, it took me two hours and 35 minutes to tell him that we no longer believed he had effective control and that the United States would look with disfavor upon his remaining perpetually in Cuba. In other words, it took me two hours and 35 minutes for me to tell the chief of state to leave his own country and to step down. I also had to tell him that he would not be welcome in the United States, that his family would be, but that we couldn't let him come because we were afraid of the troubles that it would create from the political asylees that were there from Cuba. I'm going to ask that question over again, I may, if I may. Were you instructed by the American State Department to notify Batista that he must leave his country? Yes, I was instructed by the State Department to notify Batista that he would have to step down. And it took me two hours and 35 minutes to do so. But I must explain this. It wasn't all done in one day. I received communications which went through private sources that were the, nobody in the State Department knew what was sent because it did not go over the regular coded messages. It went through CIA connections. And I had various conversations with Gonzalo Guell, who was both the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister, and we discussed it together. And of course, after every talk we had, he would notify the President, and I would send a duplicate report complete report of full conversations that I had with Dr. Guell. And then finally, on the final day, when I went up to see the president, he knew beforehand what I was going to say because he had been informed by Dr. Guell, the foreign minister and the prime minister. But it still took me two hours and 35 minutes to get the point across because I spent a great deal of time pointing out that we appreciated what a great friend he had been to the United States any matters that came up before the United Nations, not only to Cuba's supporters, but the president of Cuba went out of his way to line up other Central American nations and other Latin American nations to support us. And he, the ambassador from Cuba, Dr. Porcho Nuando, was a valuable friend of the United States. I pointed out all these things. I pointed out the fact that he'd helped us in World War II, <coughs> that he had been uh, a loyal friend of the United States. However, we felt that he lost effective control and that it would be in the best interest if he left Cuba. But at that point, was there any other alternative than Fidel Castro? There had been, for six months prior to that, numerous viable alternatives without Castro and without Batista. And I never could receive any support from the State Department. And those viable, those, and when I say I believe they were viable, the Papal News Show believed they were viable, and I believe they were viable, and he was ready to carry on with them because he knew that I could not obtain the green light from the State Department. But at the point where you went to Batista and told him he was going to have to leave, was there any other alternative at that point other than Fidel Castro taking over? Well, by that, if he left, it was just Fidel Castro was going to take over. Pure and simple. Pure and simple. All right, sir. And there was no compromise. There was no, nothing with Fidel Castro. Nobody could control Fidel Castro. Many of the emissaries from the 26th of July movement that were crowding the corridors of the State Department always believed and told our people on the fourth floor that they would be able to control Fidel Castro, that he was a youth who was irresponsible, but that they would be able to control him after he took over. Now, the proof of that, that they couldn't control him was when, when Dr. Guillermo Belt, 
who was the former ambassador to the United States from Cuba, came to me one day and said the strike which is going to take place on the 1st of April of 1958 will not be a success. Uh, and I said, why do you say that? And he said, because the mayor, of, not, not the mayor, but the leader of the revolutionary movement in Havana sent word to Fidel Castro that when the revolution was a success that they would take over in Havana and they would appoint the mayor and would take over. Fidel Castro sent word back to them, nobody's going to take over but me. And whereupon they sent back word and said, all right, if you feel that way about it, we will not take part in the strike. And of course, if they didn't take part in the strike, the strike wouldn't be successful in Havana and then it wouldn't be successful throughout the, the country. This is how we knew, or at least how I knew, that there was no controlling of Fidel Castro. He was going to run the show all by himself. And once Castro did come to power, did we promptly recognize him? Did we support him? Yes, we recognized him. I think we recognized him too soon. The policy of the United States had always been that we did not recognize any country that it had a revolution. We did not want to be the first. We did not want to be the last. We wanted to be in between somewhere. And the United States policy had always been that we want to assure ourselves that they would honor international obligations which had been incurred by the previous administration and that the new government would not become as dominated. We did not wait for any of these. Uh, and uh, Fidel Castro came into Havana on the 1st of January and I was sent, recognized him and gave him his papers of recognition, I think it was either about the 6th of January, maybe it was the 7th of January. It would have been sooner. I was asked to come to Washington so that they could give me the papers, send me back, and I refused to go. That was on the 3rd of January until all Americans had, been, had left Cuba. I wasn't going to leave Cuba and take a seat on an airplane or a place on a ship that some American could get out. Until. I wasn't going to leave until it was ready. And when I told him that uh, it was clear now from my point of view to come up that I flew up. And that was on the 6th of January. Do you see any parallel between what happened in Cuba and what has recently happened in Nicaragua? <laughs> yes, I believe that Nicaragua is Cuba all over again. Exactly the same things. We uh, are responsible for the removal of Samosa, the same as we were responsible for the removal of Batista. We uh, would not support Somoza, we would not give him arms, we shut off the arms going in there, and we winked at the arms going in to the, to the uh, Sandinistas, but we wouldn't uh, support him, and uh, it, it actually, some people have said that we didn't support Castro, even after he got out, we did. We went right on with the subsidy on uh, the exporting of American sugar. Uh, which had been done actually since the days of Roosevelt. We continued it through all the regimes there, and we continued to do it with Fidel Castro. And uh, the same support went to the Sandinistas. And is there a communist influence within the Sandinista movement? Well, yes. Thomas Borgay, who was the uh, chief security officer and in charge of the police, is a self-proclaimed Marxist. They have a junta there, five of which two are Marxists. They claim that three are conservatives, but uh, uh, there's no proof of that. And all we have to do now is look at the record of what's happened there. Why do you feel our State Department wanted to topple Batista and bring Fidel Castro to power when he did have a, a leftist leaning when there was communist infiltration of his movement? Well, first of all, we don't have a foreign policy. As ambassador, to a foreign country, the United States ambassador, I was never told what our foreign policy was. I don't believe we have one. The only policy that I can assure you that we've had so far is for the overthrow of all rightist dictators who are friendly to the United States and anti-communists. And then when we do overthrow them, we don't, aren't prepared to go in and set up elections to see that they're honest. We step out and that's when the communists step in. It seems that we always oppose the rightist dictators and we support the leftist dictators. Is there any reason for this? Well, the only reason I can give is that they believe a leftist dictator is more progressive. And by progressive you mean socialistically inclined? Oh, yes. Ambassador, why is it that we always seem to be opposing rightist dictatorships, whereas we always seem to be supporting leftist dictatorships? Well, the only answer I can give you that is because they consider 
leftist dictators as being progressive. But certainly aren't they totalitarian? Say that again. Certainly aren't these leftist dictatorships just as totalitarian? In fact, many times much more totalitarian and much more ruthless than the rightist dictatorships? They're worse. All you've got to do is take Stalin, for example, and what goes on in Russia. All right, sir. What do you think is the future of Central America? Well, the present future would appear that it, uh, we've lost Panama, at least I believe Panama is going to be communist. Nicaragua is. Nicaragua is Cuba all over again. El Salvador was overthrown and there is a, a military government there now, but it would appear that the communists are going to take over in El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, and uh, Costa Rica. Costa Rica is already in the hands. And then it is possible that they will move on up into Mexico and Venezuela because of the oil. I see. I'm going to ask that. Now this, this is, uh, and what are we going to do about it? Nothing. The Monroe Doctrine is dead. Our actions have indicated that. I'm going to ask that again. What, in your opinion, is the future of Central America today? It would appear Central America is going to be under the communist uh, control, and uh, I see a very bad future. Nicaragua has already gone communist, and then we're going to have El Salvador, uh, Guatemala, Honduras, and Costa Rica. What about Panama? The same pattern is going on. Well, the Panama Canal, the American Canal in Panama was surrendered to the Panamanian government, which is under the control of the Castro and the communists. What about islands in the Caribbean? And the islands of the Caribbean, that's also. On the last chapter of my book, which I wrote in 1962, I said that we must be prepared to do something and stop Otherwise, eventually we will have a red lake. The Caribbean will become a red lake. In Granada, they moved in. In Jamaica, it's practically be communist. Guyama uh, is communist. Of course, Cuba is communist. Uh, so they're closing in on us from all sides. The, not only is the Monroe Doctrine dead by our actions, but it's about time that we stood in there and reinforced it. Now we enacted it. Could Fidel Castro have taken power in Cuba without the active support of the American State Department? No, Fidel Castro, of course, could not have taken over in Cuba without the support of the fourth floor. What, in your opinion, is the future of America if we continue following the same foreign and domestic policies we followed for the May past I go 20 back years? One thing, add one thing without the support of the fourth floor and the press in the United States. They had a dictatorship uh, in Cuba. It was a pro-communist dictatorship. And uh, the army said, we've got to do something about it. Three sergeants led a bloodless coup. One of them was, of course, uh, Batista. And uh, immediately, in 1933, the United States government recognized Batista's government and immediately granted Cuba full independence. So obviously, we supported what he had done. In 1940, a democratic election was held, Batista was elected, and of course established a free enterprise system, got away from socialism, and uh, things were going pretty well. But by 1944, while the communists were there, they were working, there was another election, Batista lost the election. They didn't have voting machines at that time, but uh, under these circumstances. Uh, by 1948, uh, the new regime, of course, was uh, pretty well corrupt, moving towards communism. Batista had actually left Cuba. He'd come to Florida. He was going to get out of politics. Cuban military asked Batista if he would uh, run for the Senate. Batista said, no, I'm not going to run for the Senate. I'm through him. But they put his name in, running for the Cuban Senate. He was elected. So he went back there and, and of course, since began to, um, uh, was there. Uh, the regime was totally corrupt. I mean, they were stealing money, they were supposed to be burning money that was outdated and they were keeping it, and, and the country was going from bad to worse. So again, the, the Cuban military asked Batista uh, to take over control, and of course, uh, they had a revolution, and uh, 
Batista once again uh, became the temporary dictator of Cuba. Now in 1948, there was a Pan-American conference that was held in Bogota, Colombia. At that time, a young revolutionary named Fidel Castro seized the radio station in, in Bogota and said, this is a Cuban revolution and I am Fidel Castro leading this revolution. All of our State Department officials were there. They knew Fidel Castro was a communist at that time, but they certainly didn't want the American people to know that. Well, anyway, it was in March of 1952 that Batista led another bloodless coup. Nobody was killed. Uh, and uh, the following year, on July 26, 1953, Fidel Castro led a revolution where they actually uh, tried to overthrow the government. Uh, he failed. He was arrested. He was sent to the Isle of Pines where he had a private room, a car. Uh, he could travel. He could do whatever he wanted to. But he was a political prisoner. Nobody was killed. In November of 1954, another democratic election was held with representatives from around the world, held in Cuba, and of course, Batista was elected by the people president. And Batista made one serious error. He turned Fidel Castro loose. And Fidel Castro... Now, remember the Spanish-American War? Probably most of you don't remember it, but it was a... <laughs> it was in 19... Uh, pardon me, it was 1898. And as a result of this war, which was truly an imperialistic war, why we ended up controlling Cuba and the Philippines and Puerto Rico and, and all of these countries that had been controlled previously uh, by, um, uh, by the, the Spanish. So in 1902, why the American government, look, you have Trump power there, and then the American government granted limited independence to uh, Cuba, but we reserved the right to intervene at any time. By 1928, there was a President Machado who was in, in power in Cuba. He was pro-communist, and, and of course, when he, uh, his term in office was up, he refused to leave. So uh, by 1930, then, in December of 1956, after going to Mexico, which most of you don't know, but has been a communist country for many, many years, they had their communist revolution back in the 1930s, and he was able to get all sorts of support for his communist revolution there. Instead, they were being invaded by Mexico today, whether you know it or not. Anyway, in 1956, In December, Fidel Castro attacked Oriente province with 150 men. Only 12 or 13 survived. One of them was Fidel Castro. And so in February 1957, why Herbert Matthews was sent by the New York Times uh, to Cuba to interview Fidel Castro and came back and announced that he was the true Robin Hood. He wasn't a communist at all. He was the Abraham Lincoln of the revolution. And Fide Fide Herbert Matthews over and over again made the statement, Fidel Castro is not a communist. Articles picked up.